Welcome to Lecture 3 of BIB 102 New Testament Survey. Today's lecture is going to be on the overview of the Gospels. And today we're going to talk about how they're important, some unique characteristics about them, and then their differences. So let's get started. Now let's look at the introductory paragraph in your notes. It says here that the Gospels deal with the life and ministry of Jesus the Christ. And that word Christ is from the Greek word Christos, which means anointed one. The Hebrew equivalent of anointed one, Christos, is Messiah. So if you've ever heard Jesus called the Messiah and wondered what that means, it means he's the anointed one. And not only do we need to define what Christos or Christ means, but let's look at the word gospel. The word gospel literally means good news. So when we talk about the gospel of Matthew, we're talking about the good news of Matthew, the good news of Mark, and so on. And this word actually is from the Greek word euangelion, which is translated evangel. So if you've ever heard of an evangelist, an evangelist is an individual who goes around preaching the gospel, preaching the good news of what Christ has done for us. And it needs to be noted that only four gospel accounts are accepted as scriptural accounts of the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. Now, the reason why I even point that out is because there are many gospels that have been come down throughout the ages that purport to be gospels of Philip or Peter or even Judas, the one who betrayed Jesus. Those are not actual gospel accounts. The best explanation we have for those is that those were individuals many years after the, uh, the apostles' death, many years later, these individuals wrote these as if they were giving accounts from the apostles. We would just call this a like historical fiction novel, but those are not accepted as real gospel accounts. So now let's talk about their importance. Why should we study the gospel. So letter A, they form the foundation of the Christian faith. If you say you are a believer in Christ, then that means you follow the teachings of Jesus. Well, where do we find those teachings? They are found in the gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And not only are they foundational, but letter B, they are real historical accounts of Jesus God's Son. That right there is extremely important because the closest records we have to the life of Jesus are in the four gospel accounts. Now, let me give you this example. If we were going to do a research paper on someone like Martin Luther King Jr., if you had two options, a book written by Martin Luther King Jr.'s friend or a book written by someone many years later, which one would you believe to be the most accurate? Well, most of us would say, no, we need to go with the original source, the one who knew him, who was friends with him. Could the person writing today give you some good information? Of course, but the ones that we should look at the most and give the most credibility to are the closest to the individual. Well, when it comes to the Bible, the closest documents that we have to the life of Jesus are found in the Gospels. So we need to take them with that authenticity and accuracy and credibility to believe what they say. And then letter C, they account for 48% of the New Testament. That right there is interesting, and I'm sure if you just heard that a number given, you were probably a little shocked because you think, well, that's just four books. There's so many other books after John, right? Yes, there are. But if you look at how much of the New Testament is found in the Gospels, then what you look at is you actually see almost half of the entire New Testament, almost half, 48%, is found in the Gospels. So, should we study the Gospels to be able to have a better understanding of the New Testament? Of course. If we neglect those four books, then we're neglecting almost half of the New Testament. So now that we've talked about their importance, now let's look at their unique 
characteristics. And if you're looking through your notes, you're going to need to turn the page to a little chart that I put together for you to be able to look at how each gospel presents Jesus in different ways. All four of them are going to present Christ in their own unique way. So this chart we're going to fill in will tell you how each gospel talks about Jesus in a different way. Let's start by looking at Matthew. In Matthew, he presents Christ as the King, the Messiah. Now, Matthew is a very Jewish book, and he's writing to a Jewish community trying to explain to them how Jesus truly was the King of Israel and truly was the anointed Messiah. Now, Mark, Mark portrays Christ as a servant. That Jesus came to serve mankind, and when you read all throughout Mark, you will find that that is the overarching theme of the entire book, is Jesus serving man. Now Luke, Luke presents Christ as a man. So well, why is that? It's because we do not need to neglect the fact that, yes, Jesus is God, but he was also a man. He went through what we went through. He felt pain like we felt pain. Every aspect of humanity he felt, except he never sinned. And then lastly, John portrays Christ or presents Christ as God. He's trying to show that you and I need to realize that Jesus was not just a good person. He was not just a servant. He was not just a king. He was and is God. And then if you look at the next line, the arrangement there, Matthew and Luke are actually topical in their arrangements. Mark and John are the ones that are chronological or sequential. So Matthew and Luke kind of put things together in different topics, whereas Mark and John, they go through and say, let me tell you in a more orderly way, this is what happens, and this happens next, and this happens next. And now let's look at the other aspects of this. If you look at the emphasis here, the emphasis with Matthew is on sermons. Why? Because that's what kings do. They give speeches. Mark is miracles. And again, if Jesus came to serve, then he's going to do things. Well, what did Jesus do to serve mankind? Well, he performed a lot of miracles. With Luke, it's parables. And the cool thing about the parables and why Luke he emphasizes them is because a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And if Jesus was the God-man as Luke tries to portray him, he's trying to explain to humanity the deep things of the heavenly. And then John, he emphasizes signs. Signs of what? Signs that Jesus really was God. And then the tone, Matthew's very prophetic because Jesus fulfilled prophecies of the Old Testament that he really was the Messiah. Mark is practical, a servant. You want someone who is helping with something to be practical. Luke is historical. Luke was the thinker. He was a physician, so he liked to, to study details and facts. He's very historical in his writing. And then John is deeply doctrinal. John is probably my favorite gospel um, account, and it's very deeply doctrinal. Great information we learn from that. And then the addressees here, Matthew, like I said earlier, addresses the Jews, Mark the Romans, Luke the Greeks, and John says, I'm trying to talk to the whole world so that everyone will be saved. Now let's move on to the genealogy. Now the genealogy is just a big word for family history, and we have things like that today, the DNA testing, you find out about your ancestry, where you came from. Well, with Matthew, the book of Matthew actually gives us the genealogy of Jesus through Joseph. And the reason why this is, is because if Jesus truly was the king, a king has to trace, trace his heritage, his family, to the rightful king. Well, for Jesus, the rightful king of Israel was David. And if you look at the genealogy in Matthew, you see all the way down from David to Joseph, Jesus is born as the adopted son of Joseph. And again, adoption gives him all the legal rights of the heir to the throne, just like Joseph. Now, Mark, Mark doesn't give us genealogy. You want to know why? Because we don't really care whose parents a servant is. You and I, we don't go to a restaurant and before someone serves us our drinks or our food, and we don't say, well, first tell me who your parents are. I'd like to know if you can. No, we don't care. They don't care about who our parents are. We don't care about their parents. That, that is not a part of um, the, you know, the involvement with we have each other as a, in a servant relationship. But Luke does. Interestingly, 
Luke gives us the genealogy through Mary. Now, if you compare Matthew and Luke, you're going to find that they, they are very similar, then they branch off. That is because, yes, Joseph and Mary were both descendants of David. But, don't freak out over that. Yes, that means technically they were cousins, but such distant cousins that you were probably related to your friends more than they were, and you just don't even realize it. And then John, no genealogy in John because John is presenting Jesus as a God, and God had no beginning. And then the topography here, Matthew, Mike, this is Matthew, Mike, Matthew, Mark, and Luke primarily focus in the Galilean ministry. And the Galilean ministry was one of acceptance. When Jesus was in Galilee, the people loved him, they accepted him. John, he actually f focuses on the Judean ministry and the area of Judea where Jesus was hated and despised and eventually crucified. Because John, he focuses most of his writing on that last week of Jesus' life where he's in Jerusalem, where he's arrested and betrayed, or excuse me, betrayed first, then arrested, and then um, tried and sentenced to death. And then the final section of the Gospels compared is on this last uh, slide, where Matthew, he's going to stress the royalty of Jesus. Again, his theme is Christ as King. He's going to talk about royalty. Mark is humility. Mark stresses the humility of Christ. And again, if you've ever been in the service industry, you know you have to have a heart of humility because you are taking care of other people. And sometimes that can really go against our pride. But humility is the aspect of a true servant. And then Luke talks about the humanity of Jesus. If he's presenting Christ as man, which he is, then he's going to talk about the humanity of him. And then lastly, John talks about the deity of of Christ, the deity. And that deity means is a big word for godness. And again, goes with the theme, John presenting Jesus as God. Now the key words here, the key word in the Gospel of Matthew is the word fulfilled. And the reason why this is, is because Matthew is trying to build a case that Jesus really was the Messiah. And if he really was the Messiah, the King of Israel, then he had to fulfill Old Testament prophecy. And that is something that if you ever get a chance to do and study on your own, it is fascinating the vast number of prophecies of the Messiah that Jesus fulfilled to a T. No, no hinting around it. He exactly every aspect of it was fulfilled by him. And then Mark's key word is immediately. And with the servant relationship, when do you want somebody to wait on you? When do you want your drink filled at a restaurant? You want it filled immediately. And with Luke, the key word, actually it's technically three words, so sorry, it's son of man. And this is emphasizing again, remember, he's the son of Mary, the son of a human. So he's emphasizing that humanity. And the last one, the key word is, with John, is believe. And if John is writing his gospel about how Jesus is God, then his, his end goal was that we would just not just know about him being as God, but we would believe on him as God actually the God-man and have everlasting life. And then the key verses there, uh, if you want to look these up on your own, Matthew 2, Mark 10, Luke 19, and John 20. Now let's move on to their differences. Letter A in your notes says there are three gospel accounts that are considered synoptic or very similar. And the word synoptic literally means same view which these three gospel writers had the same view, the common approach to addressing their topics. Now let me show you a picture of something on the screen. If you look on the screen right now, many of you will see a bunny rabbit, or you might see a duck, or you may say, oh, I see both, which is good, of course, to see both. However, most people, when this image comes up, they first see either a duck or a bunny. Okay, now, which one is right? The answer is both. You're looking at the same picture and describing it in a different way because this is kind of an optical illusion. Let me show you another one. Right here, you either see a tiger or you see a forest. Or, I know, you say, I see both. But originally, the first thing that you saw was either that forest or that tiger. And again, which one is right? 
Yes, they're both correct. That is an example of how all three gospel writers, the synoptic gospel writers, can talk about the same event, but talk about it in different ways. They don't contradict each other. They're actually complementing and helping each other. A modern day example would be if you were the witness of a car accident. If you had four witnesses to a car accident, each individual is going to give different aspects of that accident. And by taking those different aspects and putting them together, you have a better picture of the whole. So then what are those three synoptic gospel accounts? Well, they are Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those three individuals, they tell many of the same events that happened in Jesus' life, but with just variation of their details. Now, number three, it's interesting to note that John Mark's gospel account was most likely written first. Now, in the chronology I gave you, I talked about how Matthew may have been written first, and there is a lot of debate on who wrote who's first, but the majority of thought in theology today is that John Mark was the one who wrote his gospel account first. So now let's talk about some of their differences in relation to John's gospel account. His is extremely unique. And you see here in the slide, there's nothing for you to fill in. But I want you just to take note of this and look at the things that John omits from his writing. John doesn't include the birth of Jesus. Why? Maybe it's because he's trying to portray him as God and God doesn't have a beginning. There's no youth. There's no baptism. No temptation. Can't tempt God. There's no transfiguration, no ascension, no demons. And while, whereas the paranormal may scare us, demons mean nothing to God because he created all the angels and the, even the ones that fell. And there's no Last Supper, there's no agony, and there's so much more that John omits. But there are many things that he does include that are vital to us understanding the life of Christ. So now that we've talked about things that John omits, let's talk about a few things that only John includes. Letter A, six of the eight miracles recorded in John are unique to his writings. Six of the eight. The only two miracles that Jesus, oh, excuse me, John records that Jesus performed that can be found in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, or Luke, is the feeding of the 5,000 and Jesus walking on water. That's it, just those two. The other six that he mentions, they're only found in the Gospel of John. Not only that, but conversations with Nicodemus, the Samaritan woman, and many others are only recorded in John's Gospel. Say, so, well, why is that significant? Well, let's just take the first one, Nicodemus. Nicodemus' conversation with Jesus happens in John chapter 3. And without John recording this conversation, we would not have the most famous verse in all the New Testament, John 3.16. Jesus is actually giving that verse to Nicodemus and telling him that God loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. That was Jesus' way of literally witnessing to Nicodemus so Nicodemus would believe in him as the Messiah. And then the Samaritan woman, that is one of my favorite stories in the entire Bible because that was Jesus' way of showing us that God does not care your gender, God does not care your, your race, God does not care your, your creed, he loves everyone and wants everyone to come to know him. And then lastly, only John includes that Peter was a disciple who cut off Malchus's ear at Jesus' betrayal and arrest. Now, the Synoptic Gospels do talk about this event, but they just say that a disciple cut off a high priest servant's ear. John says, oh, oh yeah, it was Peter. He just throws Peter right under the bus. And while we could have guessed that, yeah, sure, maybe it was Peter who did this, John just comes out and says it. It was Peter. He's the one that did that. And throughout the semester, when we talk about John and Peter, you're going to start seeing there's a little bit of a rivalry between them, um, who could run the fastest, who could get to Jesus the fastest and from a boat, different things like that. So when it comes to this, I'm sure John enjoyed telling everybody 
who it was that cut off, who was a hothead who cut off somebody's ear. And the person whose ear he cut off is very important as well. When we, when we get to that part in the class, you'll, you'll understand why. And then letter D, there's so much more that John says he wished he could have recorded. In fact, John 21, 25 is one of my favorite, if not my favorite verse in the entire Bible. In that passage, John says there's so much more that Jesus did that if he were to write it all down, he supposed that not even the world itself could contain the books written. How amazing is that? That Jesus did so much more than we even have record of that it would take the whole world to contain the library of Jesus' actions. Now, while I'm sure there's, a, there's some hyperbole that John is using there, it still tells us that I really think a lot of eternity, when we get to spend with him, is going to be learning what else he did. Because I cannot wait to sit down one day and hear all the other amazing stories that Jesus performed, amazing things he did while he was on this earth. So that will be the conclusion of the notes before you take test number one. So for test number one, it's going to c cover the introduction to the New Testament notes and the overview of the gospel notes. And I already emphasized this. Make sure you know the typical order of the New Testament from Matthew the Revelation for your test. Make sure you take those cahoots, play them, they will help you as well. But I cannot stress enough to study those notes, take good notes, because that is where you're going to benefit from your studying to be able to do well on the test. That concludes the third lecture for BIB 102. If you have any questions, please do not um, hesitate to email me or contact me in some way and ask. I'm here for you. I love you, and if you need anything, please let me know.